Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 106, The Ritual Begins. Lumion noticed that the black-robed man's face was nearly identical to his own, save for a few subtle differences. The depths of the stranger's light blue eyes held a faint silver-black hue. It was unclear whether the shadow of the hood affected the man's complexion or if his skin was naturally a shade darker. Who are you? Lumion blurted out in shock, his words muffled by the cloth in his mouth, leaving only indistinct movements. The black-robed man smiled without introducing himself, turning and walking towards the padre. Lumion strained to follow, desperate to learn the man's identity, his purpose, and why he had appeared in the dead warlock's tomb. This was crucial to him. Although the padre's ability to retain memories within the loop was surprising, it wasn't inexplicable. Lumion's theories about the nature of the loop could account for such an anomaly. After all, Madame Puali's was a prime example. However, the black-robed man's sudden appearance was entirely unexpected. It wasn't his presence that was startling. Lumian had always suspected another individual, apart from the owl, and the occupant of the coffin, to be the mastermind behind Cordu's abnormalities. What truly shocked him was the striking resemblance between the black-robed man and himself. It suggested the man could be another version of Lumian. His theories about the loop's nature failed to explain this baffling revelation. Something's not right. Lumion struggled to lean forward, but the ropes held him fast, causing him to crash onto the altar with a thud. His nose, which had ceased bleeding, began to flow anew, and the red, swollen wounds grew more prominent. Undeterred, Lumion pressed on. Unable to use his limbs, he relied on Dancer's incredible flexibility, slithering towards the black-robed man with great difficulty. His mind raced with thoughts. I have to find out who this black-robed man is and why he's here. This must be a manifestation of the loop's essence. Unraveling this secret could provide hope of using the loop to escape the current predicament and ultimately resolve the anomalies plaguing Cordu. Drip, drip. Blood from Lumion's face stained the ground a vibrant red. His body smeared the crimson hue in all directions as he writhed in his struggle. The scene was chaotic and reeked of blood. He strained to reach the black-robed man, but couldn't utter a sound. His face, contorted by pain and anxiety, was a horrifying sight. The black-robed man, bearing an uncanny resemblance to Lumion, glanced down and instructed the padre, Guillaume Bennett, begin the ritual. All right, Guillaume Bennett told Pierre Barry at the edge of the altar. Bring Lumion to the altar. Pierre Barry strode over, gripped Lumion under his arm, and hoisted him up. No, Lumion thrashed with all his might, like a fish freshly yanked from the water. Pierre Barry nearly lost his grip due to Lumion's slipperiness. The gentleness in Pierre's eyes quickly vanished, replaced by a ferocious and brutal glint. His strength surged as he forcefully restrained Lumion and flung him onto the altar. Afterward, Pierre Barry glanced at Lumion and chuckled. You better hope you die during the ritual rather than live through it. You'll regret it, I promise. Is this a response to my earlier provocation? Just as this thought crossed Lumion's mind, he saw Auror, clad in a simple white robe, approach his side. She leaned against the altar adorned with lilacs and tulips, her gaze vacant as she stared at her brother. The cathedral's villagers swarmed forward, forming a semicircle around the altar. The padre retrieved two grayish-white candles, positioning them at the corresponding locations of Auror and Lumion. Next, he placed a candle beneath his feet, creating a pattern on the altar with two candles above and one below. After a few moments, the padre ignited the three candles in sequence, from top to bottom and left to right, using his spirituality. A faint sweetness wafted into Lumion's nostrils, leaving him disoriented. The scene felt inexplicably familiar. Ryan, Lee, and Valentine stealthily approached the side of the eternal blazing sun cathedral, clutching a brownish-yellow suitcase. Hidden in the shadows, they peered through the stained glass to see the eternal blazing sun's altar transformed. They spotted Lumion bound on the left and Aura standing on the right. They saw the padre facing the siblings, a lit grayish-white candle beneath his feet, flanked by the enigmatic black-robed man and Pierre Barry. Valentine's fists clenched as a golden light flickered in his eyes. Lee cast a sidelong glance at him, concerned her companion might be consumed by rage. Fortunately, Valentine was a seasoned purifier who had completed numerous missions. He understood what needed to be done and what to avoid. Ryan averted his gaze and lowered his voice. We'll move closer to the altar, shatter the glass, and launch a surprise attack. Our goal is to grab Lumion and Auror and be out of the village within a minute. If we don't achieve our objective in that time, abort the mission and flee to the river. Trigger the loop proactively. All right, Valentine and Lee murmured in hushed tones, each nodding in agreement. Ryan added, Valentine, ready sunlight. We can't hold back any longer. We have to deploy 2-217 now. 
No problem. Valentine responded as Lee retrieved a box of matches. She manipulated the silver bell on her veil and boots, sprinting around Cordu's square at breakneck speed while tossing matches at various points. This marked a predetermined escape route. Magicians didn't perform unprepared. Once Lee had completed her task, the trio of official investigators cautiously circled beneath the stained glass to the side of the altar. Valentine peered inside and told Ryan, The ritual is about to commence. We must act now. Ryan, also observing the cathedral's interior, furrowed his brow and asked, Did you notice anything off? Lee hastily replayed the scene she had just witnessed in her mind, replying with apprehension, I can't hear anything from inside. They were a mere three meters from the closest villagers, yet they couldn't discern any sound emanating from within. The villagers were clearly engaged in animated conversation. Ryan's eyes narrowed, and a suspicion instantly took shape in his mind. He stood up and rammed into the stained glass window before him, disregarding that the cultists inside the cathedral might discover his presence. Clangs echoed as the delicate glass remained unbroken, but the villagers within the cathedral seemed oblivious to the chaos outside. As Ryan summoned the Dawn Armor and Sword of Dawn, Lee sprinted in circles outside the window. This time, not a single deliberately uncontrolled silver bell jingled. From Lee's perspective, this implied there was no danger, yet, how could there be no threat emanating from the cathedral? Thus, she concluded that the correct answer was, the situation was extremely dangerous. It was so dangerous that the silver bell sealed artifacts were utterly disrupted or dared not react. Bang, the Sword of Dawn, forged from light, struck a pane of stained glass but failed to have any impact. It seemed as if the entire cathedral was shrouded by an invisible, terrifying force that barred outsiders from entry. A brilliant pillar of light, encircled by flames, descended from the sky as Valentine spread his arms. However, it didn't appear inside the cathedral as he had anticipated. Instead, it landed outside the stained glass, causing ripples. It appeared that the interior and exterior were entirely isolated. Ryan made a quick decision and said to Valentine and Lee, let's try the sealed artifact. If it doesn't work, we'll leave the village to trigger the loop. Ryan didn't suggest immediate retreat because he hoped to barge in and save Lumian and Auror. He suspected that once the ritual truly began, the loop might be affected. In that case, they wouldn't be able to leave Cordu or restart everything there. Wasting no time, Valentine summoned the illusory golden flames. With two pops, Ryan opened the suitcase and retrieved the Tenego Scarecrow, its skin already half covered. He pressed the Scarecrow's front against the stained glass and untied the thick black cloth. A pair of human-like eyes appeared on 2 to 217 seconds face, devoid of emotion and embedded within the brownish-green straw. The eyes swiveled and locked onto Pons Bennett, standing at the edge of the altar. The villain froze, then bolted toward the window. As he ran, his body vanished, leaving his clothes to flutter to the ground and cover his leather shoes. A piece of skin-covered flesh emerged on the Tenego Scarecrow's neck, fusing with the stock below. It works, Ryan and the others exclaimed, elated. This meant that breaking into the cathedral wasn't impossible, and the altar's protection was not impregnable. The horoscope is about to change. It's finally happening. Amidst the villagers' uproar and the surrounding scent of grey amber, cloves, musk, and tulips, Lumian experienced an uncanny sense of deja vu. Relying on Dancer's flexibility, he forced his upper body up despite being bound. The next second, he saw the Padre open his mouth and shout in ancient Hermes, the mighty circle of inevitability. As soon as the words left his lips, darkness enveloped the cathedral's interior, and the villagers fell silent. The orange flames on the three candles were reduced to the size of pepper granules, now tainted silver and black. Lumian's mind buzzed as the familiar burning sensation ignited in his chest. His vision blurred, and the vacant-eyed Auror, the solemn-looking Padre, and the hooded black-robed man appeared before him in layers beneath the dazzling gold dome. A sharp pain stabbed at his head, as if something was being yanked from the depths of his memory. It felt eerily similar to the scene unfolding before him. The sense of familiarity and deja vu surged within Lumian's heart, dozens or even hundreds of times stronger than before. Thump, thump. He could hear his heart pounding. Chapter 107, Shattering. Thump, thump. Lumian felt his heartbeat pounding, as images were painstakingly dragged from the depths of his memories. His head threatened to split open. He fought against it, unwilling to continue. Outside the stained glass, Ryan observed the ritual beginning. He tossed the Tenego Scarecrow to Lee without hesitation, signaling her to use the sealed artifact against the Padre. He hefted the Sword of Dawn. Beneath the golden flames, Lee and Valentine moved to another stained glass window, a half-exposed cylindrical wall separating them from Ryan. 
They did this to evade the damage from the hurricane of light without hindering their movements. With the cathedral's defensive capability, they believed a barrier between them would suffice. After all, Ryan would do his best to control the attack's direction. Lee embraced the Tenego scarecrow from behind, pressing it against the stained glass depicting Sith. Sith's sermon. She aimed at the altar and Guillaume Bennett, the padre leading the ritual. On the other side, Ryan gripped the handle with both hands, plunging the Sword of Dawn into the windowsill. The two-handed broadsword, forged from pure light, shattered and transformed into a whirlwind of razor-sharp fragments and specks of light. The hurricane exploded and slammed into the stained glass before him. With a cracking sound, the entire cathedral trembled. Hairline fractures spider webbed across the glass surface, but it held fast. Seeing this, Ryan summoned the minuscule particles of sunrise gleam, forging a massive two-handed axe. Unable to use Hurricane of Light for now, he switched weapons. Lee and Valentine, shielded by the protruding wall, dodged the Hurricane of Light's remnants. At that moment, the Tenego Scarecrow's gaze locked onto the priest. Its eyes, set in the brownish-green straw, reflected the white-robed figure with golden threads. Lee noticed a faint silver light tinged with black materialize around the altar where Guillaume Bennett stood. With a snap, the Tenego Scarecrow's eyes burst open weeping blood-red tears. The padre glanced over before looking away. As two sheep willingly entered the altar, he intoned the incantation with calm fanaticism. You are the eternal cycle, the predestined destiny, the cause, the effect, and the process. Suddenly, the two deity representing candles on the altar elongated to the size of a human head. A howling wind swept through the cathedral, turning the villagers to statues. But silver-black warts emerged from their exposed faces and hands. The silver-black light enveloping the altar rapidly spread, engulfing the entire cathedral. The mural-filled dome became transparent, clouds dispersed, and the crimson moon darkened to the shade of blood. The stars on the black velvet backdrop flickered into existence, one by one, glowing with the intensity of the sun. In an instant, night became day. The villagers stirred and murmured dreamily. The horoscope has changed. Fortune is here. With three thuds, Ryan, Lee, and Valentine, who hadn't heard but had witnessed the scene, crumpled to the ground. They writhed, wailed, and screamed in agony. Ryan's skin turned grayish-blue, Lee's face appeared to teem with maggots and pulsing tendrils, and Valentine radiated a sun-like glow, from inside to out, from top to bottom. They were on the brink of losing control. The Tenego Scarecrow lay cast aside, trembling violently. Lumion felt his chest burn as the terrifying voice, seemingly originating from an infinite distance and yet right beside him, echoed in his ears. Invisible steel drills penetrated his skull, stirring his brain. Blood vessels bulged in pain, and silvery black spots emerged beneath his skin. An unseen force enveloped him, lifting him from the altar. The ropes binding him and the cloth gagging him crumbled to dust and dispersed in the air. Oror, too, was hoisted by this invisible force, floating above the altar and facing Lumion. His bloodshot eyes mirrored his sister's long blonde hair, vacant light blue eyes, pristine and emotionless face, and the simple yet odd white robe she wore. He recoiled, sensing a familiar deja vu from the depths of his memories. The pain was as intense as the madness. The surrounding scenes melded together in Lumion's mind. The Padre's solemn and fanatical expression the black-robed man advancing toward the altar, Pierre Berry prostrate on the ground, the transparent cathedral dome, the crimson moon and constellations in the sky, the villagers with stiff expressions, welcoming their fortune, Oror, her face contorted with pain, Lumion's head spun as his body was torn apart by an invisible force, silver-black spots multiplying on his skin. He was powerless to break free or resist effectively. Ah, Lumion screamed involuntarily as his chest was gradually pried open, casting a silvery black light onto Oror. Oror's eyes darted around, hearing the agonized cry. Her empty gaze mirrored Lumion's swollen blood vessels, his twisted face with silver-black hues beneath the surface. After a momentary pause, she instinctively reached out and pushed Lumion away from danger. Grand Sower. Lumion stared, dumbfounded, as Oror shoved him out of the altar's reach. Suddenly, the dreadful sound in his ears vanished, and the invisible restraints on his body disappeared. The burning sensation across his skin subsided, yet the pain in his head remained unchanged. Deep-rooted memories were forcibly dredged up. It was as if someone had used a hook to slowly extract his brain from his skull. Aurora's light blue eyes tainted with silver black, her blank stare, her lifeless face, and her resolute, forceful actions pushing him away flashed in Lumion's mind. It was nearly identical to what he'd witnessed moments ago, but the black-robed man was missing from the background. This amplified deja vu led Lumion to instinctively question if something similar had happened before. 
He screamed in pain once more. Bam. He plummeted to the ground after leaving the altar. Ignoring the excruciating pain in his head and his disorientation, Lumion sprang up, prepared to seize Auror and flee the altar with his sister. A figure obstructed his path. The black-robed man wearing his face struck him on the right cheek, sending him sprawling to the ground. Lumion refused to give in. With desperate courage, he rose again and lunged at the black-robed man blocking his way. Whack! The black-robed man swung his fist, and Lumion instinctively evaded. He stood stunned for a moment before a twisted smile crept across his face. He snarled, Why are you so damn weak? As weak as me. Lumion dismissed thoughts of the Padre and Pierre Berry as he lunged at the black-robed man. The man sidestepped, raising his right foot to trip Lumion's calf. Lumion didn't evade. With the terrifying flexibility of a dancer, he forced a half-turn and extended his arm to grapple his foe. Thud! He tumbled to the ground, taking the black-robed man down with him. The man nimbly raised his right hand, gripping Lumion's throat and delivering a brutal knee to his groin. Lumion didn't flinch. Bloodshot eyes locked on his opponent. He clawed at the man's eyes with his right hand. Ah! Uh, the black-robed man screamed as Lumion tore out his eyeballs, blood spurting forth. Lumion instinctively curled up, nearly passing out from the agony in his lower body. Struggling to his feet, he shot the writhing man on the ground a sinister grin. Come on, let's die together. You coward. Coward. He lunged once more, encircling the man's neck with his arms. At that moment, Pierre Berry, at the edge of the altar, staggered to his feet. Brandishing his axe, he sprinted to Lumion's side. Whack! His axe descended, only to be halted by a faint gray mist that had materialized. It failed to harm Lumion. Pierre Berry employed two different abilities, but couldn't penetrate the gray fog's defense. Guillaume Bennett, the priest, didn't hesitate and began reciting a prayer. I implore you, I beseech your benediction. I plead with you to grant me. Before he could finish, the scene transformed. The constellations in the sky shifted incrementally, deviating from their original positions. Cordu trembled violently as every house an inch of soil surged toward the cathedral. Silently, the villagers decomposed into organs. Eyeballs, mouths, noses, hearts, fingers, and flesh. A scant few reassembled into different people. Some appeared normal, others malformed, some missing parts, and some with extra appendages. The majority hurtled toward the altar and Auror. Cracks spread across Auror's body and she swiftly disintegrated into countless pieces of flesh. Witnessing this, Lumion spiraled into despair. Still, he refused to surrender. Seizing the black-robed man's head, he twisted it violently, snapping his neck under the man's horrified gaze. Lumion rose and raced toward his sister, but an invisible barrier surrounding Aurora obstructed his path. Rumble. With a muffled thud, the cathedral began to ascend. Trees, soil, and boulders from outside the village soared, accompanied by houses, furniture, and miscellaneous items. The organs of most villagers merged with Auror's flesh at the altar, contorting and writhing before morphing into a colossal being. The giant stood four to five meters tall, boasting three heads and six arms. Its entire form was composed of flesh and organ fragments, its body riddled with cracks oozing yellow pus. The central head of the giant, filled with pain and regret, strained to gaze at Lumion. Transparent, blood-hued tears trickled from the corners of his eyes. Witnessing this, Lumion's mind reeled as if cleaved by an axe. His vision wavered as he saw the shattered cathedral, the steadily rising blood-red peak, the thorny city wall formed by distorted houses, the encircling ruins around the peak, and the various monsters forced to flee the area. What? Lumion's head throbbed with pain again. As he watched countless tiny beams of light shoot from the giant and surrounding monsters, landing on his chest. He realized that the scenes buried deep in his memories had been entirely unearthed. They were nearly identical to what he saw now. This is, Lumion abruptly had a hunch and his headache worsened. Suddenly, everything before him turned eerily illusory, with pronounced cracks appearing like broken glass. This is, Lumion finally recalled something. Then, he saw the black-robed man transform into a pitch-black, repulsive liquid that soared before him and seeped into his left chest. Ah, Lumion screamed in agony as his surroundings crumbled. He snapped his eyes open and found himself lying beneath the blood-red mountain peak. The encroaching darkness, signaling the onset of night, had nearly vanished. Lumion instinctively sat up, leaning forward. He placed his hands on the ground and scanned his surroundings. He saw a twisted, thorny wall, a barren landscape devoid of vegetation, and the dream ruins beyond. He spotted Ryan, Lee, and Valentine lying at the edge of a room not far away. They were sound asleep. Lumion abruptly bowed his head, raised his hands, grasped his hair, and whispered in anguish, Is reality a dream? And the dream reality? Is this the present or the past? Auror, is Auror beyond saving? 
Yes? A woman's voice echoed in the ruins. Lumian looked up, bewildered, and faintly saw the enigmatic woman appear before him. She approached, wearing the orange dress she'd donned at the beginning. That's why you were so desperate to obtain superpowers in your dream, regardless of the consequences. That's why you disregarded others' lives and even your own. You wanted to resolve the loop embodying the concept of a problem as quickly as possible. That's why you couldn't control your instincts and uttered inappropriate words or performed inappropriate actions on certain occasions. Lumian gazed at the mysterious woman, dazed, realizing that the indescribable and inexplicable emotion in her eyes had resurfaced. This time, he could finally decipher it. It was pity. Chapter 108, Report Several days later, an investigation report on Kordu Village was submitted to Intis Intelligence and Homeland Security Committee's Bureau 8. The machinery hive mind of the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery, and the Eternal Blazing Sun Church's Inquisition. Upon receipt, the brass immediately reviewed the report. Background Over the past year, numerous disappearances have occurred in the Faina Potter Kingdom's Grabaka province, near the Dari AG region, and in the Lenberg Republic's Upper Hell State. Several Bayonders without official permission have mysteriously vanished, and these incidents seem to be connected to shepherds traveling across the three regions. Among them, those from Kordu village became our primary focus. Consequently, after receiving an unusual distress letter, we prioritized the mobilization of elite personnel and dispatched them as a joint investigation team. The investigators' complete written statements are as follows. The anomaly in Kordu village can be categorized into two levels, reality and dreamscape. Reality. Kordu was ultimately destroyed by a large-scale but unsuccessful evil god sacrificial ritual. Only a small number of villagers survived. Most villagers were utilized as nutrients for the failed creation of an evil god. The remaining individuals were reassembled in peculiar ways and transformed into various monsters. The evil god sacrificial ritual altered the landscape. The river dried up and changed course. The village square and cathedral were elevated nearly 40 meters by a small-scale orogeny forming a blood-colored pillar. The failed evil god creation was located atop the pillar. However, when we discovered it, it had already been destroyed, potentially by self-destruction or interference from other factions. Kordu's houses also underwent reassembly. Some formed a twisted, thorny city wall around the blood-colored pillar, while others were arranged in circular patterns. In these severely damaged buildings, we found only a few coins and the most common liver blue. We did not find any written information or anything that could clearly identify Kordu. The reason remains unknown. Only the House of Lumian Lee, the target, contained books, newspapers, magazines, and other items that clearly identified it. Within the ruins of Kordu, there are two abnormal areas surrounding the blood-colored pillar. One can induce a deep slumber, leading to a dreamscape, while the other is teeming with life, filled with flowers and trees, and features a self-rocking crib. Our assumption regarding the latter area is that it is closely related to Madame Puali's of Kordu. At the other edge of the blood-colored pillar, we unearthed four relatively well-preserved corpses. The location likely corresponds to the original cathedral cemetery. The first corpse was a woman, no more than 20 years old, who had been strangled to death. The second corpse was a young man, also no more than 20 years old, who had drowned. The third corpse was surrounded by coffin fragments. Female, over 60 years old, and died of mechanical asphyxiation. Based on other evidence, we speculate that she was suffocated with a pillow. The fourth corpse was male and had not decomposed. His tongue had been severed while he was alive, and there were visible ligature marks on his neck. Relevant speculations about the aforementioned corpses can be found in the Dreamscape section. Upon entering the ruins of Kordu, we were likely affected by the power emanating from Lumian Lee's body. Our memories of the date became disordered, and the thought of leaving ceased to occur to us. One by one, we fell asleep. While in the dream state, our bodies maintained a weak level of activity, eliminating the need for food replenishment for several days. Had we remained in this state for another half a month, it is uncertain whether we would have awoken from hunger or perished within the dream. The entire ruin is locked in a loop capable of reverting to its original state at any moment. The trigger point is most likely tied to Lumian Lee's self-awareness and the restrictions he imposes. The former refers to the inevitable restart if Lumian Lee's subconscious anticipates it, while the latter stems from his desire to prevent anyone from disrupting Kordu's current state and the development of the dream. Any relevant event would immediately trigger a restart. We inquired with villagers from surrounding areas, but they reported no abnormalities concerning Kordu. 
Through their responses and previously gathered information, we confirmed three points. First, there was never a legend of a deceased warlock in Kordu. Second, no elves suspected of being in the form of lizards have appeared in the Dari AG area. Third, Lent is traditional folklore and had no issues originally. Dreamscape the dreamscape originated from Lumian Lee and is so realistic that we couldn't discern that we were dreaming. We consulted psychologists and dream experts and synthesized their opinions to form a hypothesis about this dream. It is an amalgamation of Lumian Lee's personal experiences, all the novels he has read, and his assumptions and conjectures based on previous events. The dream exhibits obvious coincidences and characteristics of wish fulfillment at certain critical junctures. Within this dreamscape, not all the situations we encountered were real, nor were they entirely fabricated. Disorganized facts, the minutiae of daily interactions, and the illusory scenes that left a profound impact on Lumian Lee were reassembled in a chaotic and symbolic manner presenting themselves to us. This is both a characteristic of the dreamscape and a manifestation of Lumian Lee's subconscious avoidance or fear of certain issues. Moving forward, we will provide a detailed account of every aspect of our experience. We ought to have realized that we were in a dream earlier on. The most evident clue was that we did not recall needing to change our clothes until Lumian Lee reminded us that our garments were severely damaged. Though this is quite unusual, humans tend not to think critically within dreams. It has been confirmed that we did not send telegrams. The corresponding responses may have originated from Lumian Lee's subconscious and the knowledge he possesses. By combining the events in the dream with the situation in reality, we have arrived at the following conjectures. Our consciousness and knowledge, to some extent, enrich the dream, and we may have inadvertently exposed some of our secrets to Lumian Lee. There are at least two distinct evil god faiths in Kordu. One represents a power akin to Earth Mother's, embodied by Administrator B. Aost's wife, Madame Puales. The other is the one followed by Guillaume B. Anet, the former Padre, and the majority of the villagers. The latter faith ultimately led to Kordu's destruction. During the Lent celebration, the Spring Elf's beheading and send-off symbolized driving the force representing Madame Puales out of Kordu. There may have been a violent conflict between the two factions. Simultaneously, the decapitation of Ava Lizier, the personification of the Spring Elf, symbolized that this girl had discovered something amiss in reality. When she attempted to escape or inform others, she was clandestinely strangled to death by Guillaume B. Annette's group. Riamund Greg was thrown into the river. The appearance of his spirit body beneath the cathedral symbolizes that, like Ava, he was deemed a snitch and subsequently drowned. Jean Mori discovered that his wife, Sybil, had an affair with the former Padre. In a fit of rage, he became mute. This symbolized that as a devout follower of the eternal blazing sun, his tongue was cut off when he tried to inform others about the village's abnormalities. His subsequent disappearance implied that he had been murdered. Naroka's death shares the same potent symbolism as Ava, Riamund, and Jean. First, she must have covertly followed Madame Puales, intending to allow her deceased husband's spirit to return home through the aid of the soul messenger. Thus, her post-death behavior was to enter Paramita. Second, it is highly likely that she was killed by her youngest son, Arnold Andere, likely because she had discovered the issue with Guillaume B. Annette's group and wanted to inform Madame Puales. Based on our search of the ruins, the Lent celebration, and Madame Puales' claim that she could depart at a specific moment, it is implied that she, her husband B. Aost, butler Louis Lund, and ladies maid Cathy left Cordu before the ritual on the twelfth night. They remain alive, and their whereabouts are unknown. This is reflected in the dream by the lady's refusal to assist at critical moments. However, considering the circumstances in the peculiar area teeming with vitality, we suspect that Madame Puales left something behind before her departure and indirectly participated in the ritual on the twelfth night. The black-robed man in the warlock's tomb likely symbolizes Lumian Lee's mutated persona due to his corruption. However, for some reason, Lumian Lee did not appear to be deeply corrupted, enabling him to easily triumph during the skirmish, Given his increased courage, the bizarre lizard-like creature found in the mouths of Orly, Mitchell Garig, and others might symbolize their corruption and mutation, eventually transforming them into an alternate version of themselves. <laughs> Questions 1. How is Lumian Lee aware of the abilities of Guillaume B. Annette, Pierre Berry, and others? If he had secretly observed them in reality, it would be understandable if he remained undetected once or twice. There must be an inherent reason why he could obtain so much information without facing consequences. 2. Why did the villagers and Orly behave indistinguishably from real people, making it challenging for us to recognize that we were in a dream until Lumian Lee believed that something abnormal should have occurred to them? 
3. What does Paramita symbolize? 4. What do Madame Puali's numerous children in the castle and the crib with an invisible object represent? 5. Why did Lumian Lee use lizard-like elves to portray the villagers' corruption? 6. What do Lumian Lee and Aurelie's attempts to escape Cordu and enter Paramita signify? 7. Why did the ritual on the twelfth night fail? 8. How can Lumian Lee enable us to enter his dream? He evidently lacks the ability to do so. 9. Why did he suddenly acquire normal Bayonder powers? 10. How did he survive and cause the ruins of Cordu to enter a loop? 11. Aurelie's abnormalities occurred at entirely different times during the two cycles. What does this indicate? 12. What does the legend of the deceased warlock symbolize? 13. What does the warlock's corpse and the coffin in the underground tomb represent? 14. What does the owl symbolize? 15. What does the change in the horoscope signify? 16. What is the origin of the matter? <coughs> Conclusions and recommendations. This is a quintessential disaster resulting from the worship of an evil god. Currently, six known survivors exist. Lumian Lee, former Padre Guillaume Bianet, Puales de Roquefort, Biaost, Louis Lund, and Cathy. The latter five are adherents of evil gods. We must locate and eliminate them as soon as possible. Directly killing Lumian Lee is not advised. Until his issues are understood and resolved, his death might trigger an even more severe anomaly. The optimal solution is to capture and securely contain him. Reporters, Ryan Visha of Machinery Hivemind, Major Lee Bellot of Bureau 8, and Purifier Valentine de Lacourt of the Inquisition. Chapter 109, Minute Hope. Days earlier, beneath the Crimson Peak, adjacent to the warped city wall, Lumian knelt on the ground, gazing up at the enigmatic woman as she approached. Her words echoed in his ears, only to gradually grow muffled. Lumian's hands pressed against the ground, clenching the soil as if attempting to crush it into liquid. As the mysterious woman halted about a meter away, he scrambled to his feet, anxiety gripping his voice. Didn't you say there's still hope? Didn't you claim Aurora and the others could be saved if I broke out of the loop myself? His voice grew hoarser with each word. The enigmatic woman remained silent, her eyes filled with pity as she gazed at him. Lumian hesitated before asking, hope lacing his words, there's still hope, right? That's not just a fleeting dream. During my discussion with Auror, she spoke of things I had never heard of, like how the description of an honorific name can hint at two separate entities. His eyes locked onto the woman, fear and hope battling as he scrutinized her every move. At last, she nodded. There is indeed hope. Lumian's eyes brightened, waiting for her to elaborate. In a gentle voice, the woman explained, In truth, Auror has already died, but mystically, she's not entirely gone. Do you recall the soft, faint sounds you hear from within your body each time you perform the summoning dance? Do you remember the light fragments from Auror and the others that flew into your chest on the twelfth night ritual? Are those their spirit bodies, their voices? Lumian interrupted, eagerness filling his voice. The woman responded, a mix of calm and pity, they can only be considered soul fragments. At the end of the twelfth night, you became a conduit for the hidden entity to unleash its horrifying power. The surrounding believers, including the soul fragments of the sacrifice, were absorbed by you. Guillaume Bennett, who led the ritual, was the sole exception. Later, those soul fragments and the potent corruptive power were sealed in the left side of your chest by my lord. That's why, as you became increasingly awake in your dreams and sensed the date and loop more clearly, Aurora and the other villagers seemed more and more lifelike. They even displayed a degree of self-awareness and cognition. To truly awaken from the dream and restrain the looping power consuming the ruins, you had to rely on yourself. You had to find the courage to confront the pain, face the truth, and chase after the elusive hope. If I were to resolve it, there's only one option, to completely annihilate you in the ruins of Cordu. Otherwise, the corruption within you will seep out uncontrollably, and Aurora and the others will truly perish in the realm of mysticism. As the mysterious woman mentioned the Twelfth Night Ritual, Lumian couldn't help but remember. A sharp pain stabbed his head, and only a few images surfaced. Auror, with vacant eyes, shoved him away from the altar. Beams of light burst from Auror and the villagers, spiraling into the vortex on his chest. Guillaume Bennett, the padre, revealed a shocked expression as he fled the altar. Beyond that, Lumian couldn't recall anything else. Only the events within the dream were clear, as if some force prevented him from remembering the rest. His face contorted, his body trembling. I, I can't remember much. The woman nodded. That's normal. Firstly, it's a subconscious self-protection to prevent an overload of painful memories and intense scenes from causing you to collapse and lose control. Secondly, there are things you haven't witnessed and don't know the truth about. I don't know either. Yes, I'll need you to do something and try her eventually. There are one, no, two exceptional psychologists I know there. I can arrange an appointment for you and see who's available to treat you. 
They can help you remember more and reconstruct the events in Cordu as much as possible. Lumian's emotions roiled as he listened, but all he could muster was a soft, thank you. Fists clenched, he asked anxiously, then what can I do to bring Auror and the others back? The woman sighed, admitting, I don't know either. Seeing Lumian's eyes darken, she added, but you have to believe that true miracles exist in this world. And the great existence I mentioned earlier is synonymous with miracle. Despair and hope swelled in Lumian's heart. Though he knew the mysterious woman before him was likely offering comfort and hope, he couldn't help but say, You said that once I unlocked the secret of the dream, you'd tell me the honorific name of that great existence. Her expression grew solemn, her tone serious. I'll tell you now. Remember it well. His honorific name is, the fool that doesn't belong to this era, the mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. As she spoke, Lumian felt his consciousness slipping, as if he could see a thin gray fog and a looming castle above it. A gaze weighed upon him. Simultaneously, the entire village of Kordu shuddered as the thin fog engulfing the area receded rapidly. By the time Lumian regained clarity, sunlight had already filtered through the sky, casting golden specks upon the crimson mountain peak and desolate earth. Lumian recalled the three lines of the honorific name and his conversation with Auror in his dream. He winced, a bitter smile forming as he said, I thought there'd be a description of the past, present, and future. The enigmatic woman in the orange dress tersely acknowledged his remark. There should be another one in the future, but if I use a description other than the three lines to pray to him now, I can't guarantee the response will be from him. You should know that such a situation is very dangerous. Silent for a few seconds, Lumian then asked, a glint of hope in his eyes, if I work diligently for you, can I eventually summon that great being to resurrect Auror? That's one way, the woman said softly. You can also explore other methods. I won't stop you. I'm merely reminding you that many resurrection techniques have grave flaws. Lumian nodded, signaling his understanding. He didn't dare to inquire, yet couldn't help but ask, is there a significant chance of resurrection? The enigmatic woman glanced at him and sighed. It's very, very slim, but I know you'll still pursue it. Lumian pressed his lips together, remaining silent. It wasn't that he didn't want to assure her he'd do everything in his power to find a way to bring Aura back, but he feared that speaking would reveal the sorrow surging within his heart. After a few seconds, he asked in a raspy voice, What do you need me to do in Trier? Join a covert organization and help me gather some intel, the woman replied simply. I'll tell you how to contact them once you're in Trier. She added, besides uncovering the truth from your memories, you can also look into the survivors of this catastrophe. Survivors. Lumian's eyes narrowed. The woman nodded. Besides you, there are five others, Madame Puales, Bayost, Louis Lund, Kathy, who left Cordu before the twelfth night, and Guillaume Bennett, who was protected by the ritual as its host. They escaped before this place was completely destroyed. The Padre is still alive. Lumian's lips curled up. The enigmatic lady locked eyes with him and said, If my divination is accurate, they should be hiding somewhere in Trier. Very good. Lumian smiled, wiping the corners of his eyes. The woman then looked at Ryan, Lee, and Valentine, who slept near the room's edge on the thorny city wall, and asked Lumian, What do you plan to do with them? If they leave alive, you'll undoubtedly be hunted by Bureau 8, Machinery Hivemind, and the Inquisition. From now on, you can only hide. You'll never live openly under the sun. You'll be forever accompanied by darkness, filth, and danger. Lumian glanced at Ryan and the others, chuckling hoarsely. Will killing them bring Aura back? The woman shook her head. No. Lumian scoffed, bowing his head with his eyes closed. Soon, he looked up and asked, What's the name of the organization I'm about to join? How should I contact you once I'm in Trier? The woman sighed faintly. I'll tell you when the time comes. I'll give you my messenger's summoning method and the corresponding medium later. Contact me through that. Lumian fell quiet for a moment before posing another question. Did I possess the power to trap Cordu in a loop? Strictly speaking, you didn't. At least not before receiving the Circle Inhabitant boon, the woman explained casually. This place is corrupted by that hidden being everywhere, and the power level sealed in your left chest is quite high. Therefore, when your emotions fluctuate and you're in a subconscious state, you can mobilize the corresponding specialness to reset this place. She paused, adding, however, you've always been physically in a loop. The corruption sealed within your body allows you to reset your form at 6 a.m. every day and return to 6 a.m. on the 12th night. Only changes brought about by Bayonder characteristics and boons are retained. Is this the real reason why I recover every time I wake up from injuries in the ruins? No wonder I didn't starve to death. Lumian immediately understood. He glanced at his body, a self-deprecating smile forming. It'll always be that day. That nightmarish day. 
Without waiting for the woman's response, he looked up and asked, How should I address you? She smiled, beginning to reply, You can call me. Before she could finish, cards suddenly danced in the air. Each card bore a unique pattern, fluttering towards Lumion. Instinctively, Lumion extended his right hand, attempting to catch some of the cards. At that moment, most of the cards vanished, leaving just one. The card gently settled in Lumion's palm, face up. It depicted a figure extending their scepter into the sky and pointing at the ground with their left hand. Tarot card, Magician. Lumion glanced up in shock, realizing the enigmatic woman had disappeared. Should I call her Madam Magician? Lumion subconsciously flipped the tarot card in his hand, revealing rows of minute and tis script. The spirit that wanders about the unfounded, an upper world creature that is friendly to humans, a messenger that belongs solely to magician. Lumion studied the words for a moment before tucking the tarot card away. He glanced at Ryan and the others, then turned around and staggered away from the area. As he walked, Lumion couldn't help but look back at the blood-stained mountain peak and the twisted, thorny city wall. The Cordu in his memory had already morphed into this. It bore no resemblance to what it once was, but Lumion still tried his best to observe and search, hoping to overlap the scene in his mind with reality. He wanted to take another look at the giant atop the mountain, but he knew that it would cause him grave harm. Unwittingly, Lumion slowly circled the blood-stained mountain peak and thorny city wall, his gaze constantly scanning the distorted and chaotic objects. He knew what he was looking for, and he knew he would never find it. Just like that, Lumion arrived at the spot where the wooden wall had blocked him. Most of the area had collapsed, revealing the garden behind it. The garden was lush and vibrant, a stark contrast to the blood-stained peak, the warped city wall, and the ruins on the other side. In the center was a brown wooden crib, reminiscent of the one Lumion had seen in Madame Puales's castle. He subconsciously leaned over and realized that there was a small human-shaped indentation on the slightly aged white cotton swaddling cloth in the crib. It was as if a baby had once lain here, but its whereabouts were now unknown. What does this mean? Just as this thought crossed Lumion's mind, he felt the sunlight shining down from the sky grow much brighter. He instinctively looked up and saw golden flames completely engulfing the mountaintop. The three-headed, six-armed giant loomed in the inferno, seemingly melting. Lumion stared blankly for a few seconds before suddenly raising his hands to shield his face. The sunlight was too intense. In the semi-subterranean two-story building at the edge of the ruins, Lumion trudged to his sister's bedroom with the 237 Verl door and 46 copet he had collected. He grabbed a brown suitcase filled with clothes and memorabilia and pushed open the door. He was here to say goodbye. As soon as he stepped in and saw the desk with the manuscripts, his head throbbed as an image surfaced. Aura's eyes darted around, no longer vacant. She looked at Lumion, who had been pushed away, and said with difficulty, My notebook, Grand Sower's Witchcraft Notebook, is there important information in it? Lumion pressed his forehead, walked to the desk, and opened the drawer below. Familiar dark notebooks greeted his eyes. He suddenly remembered that Aura had taught him a great deal of mysticism knowledge before Kordu was destroyed. In Darij, at the steam locomotive station, the ticket agent eyed Lumion and asked, Where are your identification documents? I forgot, replied Lumion, clad in a linen shirt, a dark jacket, and a round-rimmed black hat, as he held a brown suitcase. He then turned and walked away from the window. A short man in a half-top hat and black suit approached Lumion, whispering, Do you want to take the courier carriage? It's headed for Big Aura. Does it require identification? Lumion inquired. The short man chuckled, responding, No need. Our business is about to be crushed by the steam locomotive. Why would we need identification documents? So, are you taking it or not? This is the last remnant of romance from the classical era. Lumion gave a slight nod and asked, How much? The short man's enthusiasm flared. Twenty Verldor to Bigora takes about a day. There are five stops in between. Each stop allows for a rest, changing carriage drivers and horses. Two of the stops also provide free food. Without further questions, Lumion followed the short man to a deserted street nearby. A large carriage drawn by four horses was parked at the roadside. Upon boarding, Lumion discovered the interior was rather spacious. Like the public carriage, it had two rows separated by an aisle, as well as space for larger luggage. He found a seat by the window, placed his suitcase down, and pulled out a book with a dark red cover. As the horses neighed outside, Lumion flipped through the book, illuminated by sunlight streaming through the window. Beside him sat a man in his thirties with a well-groomed mustache, brown hair, blue eyes, and smart attire. He glanced at the book in Lumion's hand, asking with interest, Eternal Love, Aura Lee's book, the one featuring the female lead named Kingsley and the male lead named Seal. Yes, Lumion nodded. 
The Mustached Man Became Chatty. This book is Aurelie's earliest work. The writing was quite amateurish, particularly the dialogue between characters. It doesn't sound like something people would say in real life at all. It's so emotional, it's uncomfortable. Indeed. Lumian nodded again. He bowed his head and flipped to the last few pages of the book, his gaze resting on the relevant passage. On her deathbed, Kingsley clutched Seal's outstretched hand and gazed at his anguished expression. She forced a smile and said with difficulty, Stupid, live well. <laughs> Chapter 110, Foreigner For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. From the Bible, Genesis 319 The imposing grayish-white city wall, rising to a height of three meters, loomed before Lumion, stretching as far as the eye could see. A multitude of private carriages, four-seaters, open tops, tandems, and cargo carriers queued, awaiting entry through the city gate. Blue-uniformed tax collectors and white-shirted, black-vested police officers inspected each carriage methodically. Occasionally, they would demand identification or order pedestrians to open their suitcases. Lumion, clutching his brown suitcase, scanned the scene, casting furtive glances as he sought a way to bypass the checkpoint. Before long, a man who had observed his behavior approached. What's the matter, friend? You look a bit uneasy. The man was somewhat shorter than Lumian but twice as broad. His cheeks were plump, causing his blue eyes to appear minuscule. As he neared, Lumian caught a whiff of sweat mingled with cheap cologne, prompting him to wrinkle his nose in distaste. Lumian gestured toward the gates, puzzled, and inquired, What's all this for? Are they searching for criminals? Why screen those entering Trier and not the ones leaving? The disheveled, blonde-haired man in a billowy blue shirt appraised Lumian. My friend, are you from some small city or village? Upon seeing Lumian nod, the man sighed and explained, they're collecting taxes. Tariffs? Tariffs for entering Trier. Lumian asked. The man nodded. Exactly. This city wall encircles Trier. There are 54 gates, each manned by tax collectors and police. They also apprehend wanted criminals. Are all goods taxed? Lumian inquired. Curiosity peaked. The man touched his blue canvas shirt and replied, Almost everything. Only grains and flour are exempt. Once upon a time they were, but after the war a few years back, the price of bread in Trier skyrocketed, inciting riots and protests. Eventually, the government abolished tariffs on all food. Ah, if only drinkers were as bold. Liquor, wine, and champagne are taxed the most. Many people venture to the suburbs on weekends to drink tax-free alcohol at small taverns. They call it town hopping. Interesting. Lumian nodded thoughtfully. The man glanced around and lowered his voice. If you want to avoid the tariffs, I can help you into the city. All you have to do is pay me a small fee. You mean bribe them? Lumian gestured with his chin at the tax collector and police near the city gate. The man snorted. Their greed is greater than an elephant's appetite. I'll show you a path into the city without checkpoints. But isn't Trier completely surrounded by walls? Lumian didn't conceal his bafflement. The man grinned. You'll see soon enough. Then he teased, Noble sir, do you require my assistance? Lumian considered for a moment before asking, How much will it cost? Three Verl door, the man replied with a congenial smile. If you agree, we can depart immediately. You can pay once we're inside the city. Deal. Lumian adjusted his dark wide-brimmed hat, picked up his brown suitcase, and followed the rotund man away from the city gate. Fifteen minutes later, they arrived at a hill blanketed in vegetation and soil, with grayish-white stones peeking through. Scaffolding, decaying pillowwood, and numerous pits were scattered about. It appeared to be an abandoned mine. The rotund man guided Lumian through heaps of jumbled rocks to the entrance of a mine. Is this the shortcut? Lumian asked cautiously. The portly man in the blue shirt chuckled. You really don't know much about Trier. Ever heard the saying that underground Trier is even larger than the Trier above ground? No. Lumian shook his head. The man elucidated, Trier used to be much smaller. It was surrounded by quarries that supplied stone for building the city. As the population swelled, the city had to expand outward, enveloping these quarries. As a result, the ground became riddled with holes and mine tunnels. Add to that the portion of Trier that sank underground in the fourth epoch, plus the sewers, subways, and gas pipes installed by the government, aren't these more extensive than what's on the surface? Lumian's eyes widened in understanding. Are you taking me into the city through underground Trier? Yes. The man turned, stooped, and entered the mine. He casually inquired, What should I call you? Seal. Lumian brushed back the golden hair at his temples. And you. Just call me Rames. The burly man rummaged through a pile of stones in the mine's corner and unearthed an iron black lantern. 
clearly made of metal, the rusted lantern was cylindrical, with the upper section slightly narrower than the lower. A black rubber lining encircled its base. At the junction of the narrow and wide cylinders, a polished trumpet-shaped metal piece was embedded, though a few rust spots remained. Ramey's produced a matchbox, fiddled with it briefly, and an orange flame tinged with blue erupted from the metal trumpet, illuminating the mine's depths. What's this? Lumian asked, puzzled. Holding the iron black lamp, Ramey's ventured underground, chattering. Carbide lamp, invented by the cave association. Many miners use it. I don't know why it glows, but I just need to put some rocks and water in, attach them top and bottom, and when needed, press here and ignite the mouth with flames. Carbide and water react to form acetylene which burns and emits light. Lumian recalled the chemistry he'd studied a few months prior. He remained silent for a time as he followed Ramey's underground along a disused mine tunnel. Then he inquired, the cave association, prior cave association, formed by a group of spelunking enthusiasts. Nowadays, they seem to be involved with the mines. Ramey's turned to Lumian, walking beside him, and asked with a grin, why didn't you just take the steam locomotive into Trier? The train station checkpoints aren't that strict. They just do spot checks. Lumian reminisced and replied, I wanted to experience the last vestiges of romance from the classical era. A courier carriage. Ramey's chortled. That's far pricier than a steam locomotive. Your accent gives you away as from the Riem or Riston region. The journey from the south to Trier runs about 120 Verl door, doesn't it? And it takes four and a half days. On a steam locomotive, you'd pay less than 50 Verl door for a third class seat and arrive in under 20 hours. So, the last bit of romance from the classical era, you say, sounds more like a con job for folks like you. You must have shelled out a pretty penny, huh? Lumian responded candidly, a fair amount. I've only got 267 Verl door left. Lamir glanced at him once more and averted his eyes. What a waste. Clutching the carbide lamp, he traversed an archway and veered into another passage bathed in the orange-yellow glow cast by the lamp's flame. Lumian glanced up and noticed rocks nestled in the darkness overhead, adorned with moss that wept droplets of water. The path underfoot was pockmarked with holes, and stone pillars flanked both sides, supporting the cave's ceiling. Stones and various objects were heaped between the pillars, creating a street wide enough for six or seven people to walk abreast. Under the carbide lamp's illumination, a steel nameplate affixed to a stone pillar came into view, inscribed on it in Intis, Rua Droit. There's a street name down here. Lumian queried, puzzled. Gripping the carbide lamp, Ramis chuckled and replied, Didn't I tell you? This is underground trier. In fact, it was constructed decades ago during city renovations. The brass deemed the underground too chaotic, a veritable labyrinth. Rioters, murderers, smugglers, and cultists all found refuge here, and something had to be done. Additionally, numerous houses had crumbled and sunk due to the underground quarries. Reinforcement was necessary, so City Hall spent nearly a decade repairing pillars, constructing foundations, and connecting the previously isolated quarries subterranean ruins, catacombs, and sewers. To prevent workers from getting lost, the underground streets were named to correspond with those above during the renovations. Roads, squares, and alleys were recreated down here, and nameplates were hung, marking the streets. If future repairs were needed, the names could just be referenced. In other words, Lumian gestured overhead with his free hand. The real Rua droid is just above us. Yes, Ramis pressed on. This is underground trier. There's an anti-smuggling wall up ahead. Quarry police often patrol the area, but don't fret. I'll guide you through a small tunnel. Heh. The brass, with their phony collars and lies, believe they can manage underground trier like they do above ground, but they're only aware of half the entrances and modified routes. As he spoke, he led Lumian to a dead end and located a narrow crevice to crawl through. Lumian trailed closely. Two or three minutes later, they emerged from the small tunnel. Before them stood a wall composed of stone pillars and a street wedged between. Just then, a burly figure appeared beside the stone pillar, holding a carbide lamp, and addressed Ramey's, is this our customer? Ramey's spun around and grinned at Lumian. Foreigner, I've changed my mind. The price is 265 Verl door. Wasn't I generous to leave you enough for bread and a hotel tonight? What if I refuse? Lumian's face displayed a mix of fear and defiance. Ramey's chubby face quivered with laughter. What do you think will happen? Didn't your mother warn you not to trust strangers too easily when you're away from home? 
He and the burly man closed in on Lumian from opposite directions. Lumian smiled, set down the suitcase, and advanced towards Ramez and his accomplice. In the flickering firelight, over ten seconds swiftly ticked by, and the carbide lamp ended up in Lumian's possession. Lumian crouched beside the trembling Ramez, his face battered and swollen, and pulled all the bandnotes from his wallet. In the dim orange and blue light, he counted them with grave intent. Gently patting Ramez's right cheek with the wad of cash, Lumian grinned. Now there's only 319 Verldor left. With that, he pocketed the bandnotes and strolled toward a path that appeared to lead up to the surface. A nameplate dangled from a stone pillar, inscribed with two lines of intision script, Rue du Pot de Chamber, La Marche du Courtier du Gentleman. Someone had scratched out Rue du Pot de Chamber with a stone and scrawled a new name beside it, Rue Anarchy. 